Hello. Hello, good uh, day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Um, I hope it works well with uh, all of you now joining our webinar on health security and public health policies, issues, preparedness or prevention, defense or precaution, how conflicting concepts of global health security and public health are shaping the COVID-19 response and beyond. Um, yeah, this uh, webinar is organized together by Medical International and Bread for the World, and I will introduce uh, shortly the, the order of how we do this and also give you uh, the technical details and how you can join while um, doing the seminar. Um, one, one point we want to make, we are wanting to record or we're going to record this um, seminar and make it available. Um, then, and that's also why we said, okay, it's easier you participate with your questions and comments through the chat function. Um, and then we will, we will keep this up and uh, bring this into the discussion with our panelists during these two hour sessions. So we I give you a very brief outline. We will start immediately um, with the housekeeping and uh, then we will have an introduction into the topic by Marika Hase from Bread for the World. And then we will have the presentations of the two, three panelists that we have with us. And after each of the panelists, you can uh, put some comprehension questions. So if you haven't understood everything very clearly, so these kind of short questions we would like to address immediately after each of the presentations. But then for the bigger discussion period, this is after all the three presenters, Anna Römer-Mahler, Iris Zuzek and René Lorenzon have spoken. And then we plan to discuss a very little brief lit on the panel first, and then it's your turn and your questions and comments will be put into the discussion together. Uh, I hope we can have two rounds of this uh, until we're going to conclude with uh, a way forward policy options that we also would like to hear from our panelists. And this should bring us then to 2 p.m. Uh, yeah, or maybe a little bit earlier so that we don't need to have the whole two hours on it. That's from my side at the moment, and I'm happy to hand over to my colleague Marike for our introduction. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. So, yes. Okay, so I can start. So dear uh, guests, dear colleagues, I would also like to very um, to welcome you all very warmly uh, to our, our online seminar today. Um, as in previous years, we are again organizing a parallel civil society event to the World Health Summit to address relevant current debates in global health. And it is good to see that this has met um, with such great interest. And I look forward to the next two hours with you on the topic of preparedness or prevention, defense or precaution, how conflicting concepts of global health security and public health are shaping the COVID-19 response. And as Andreas just said, I would like to give you a brief introduction into our discussion topic before we hand over to Andreas and our speakers again. So the concept of global health security has been part of the discourse on global health for several years now, and it has become more and more central to the debate, especially since the outbreak of the Ebola fever in 2014 in Western Africa. Roughly speaking, it is about protecting one's own population from global health risks. For example, cross-border pandemics such as bird flu or Ebola to be effectively fended off or combated. Outbreaks of disease are described as a security risk for the own economy or for the nation state and actions are formulated to avert this threat. 
This uh, security framing around global health seems to be shifting priorities more and more from a demand-oriented to a risk-oriented approach. It seems uh, in the sense that health is less understood as a basic need and prerequisite for social participation or also individual well-being and less a human rights that must be granted equally to everyone. So rather, it seems that there's a danger also that health concerns will only be considered relevant if there's a global security risk. Other aspects of global health are marginalized, such as non-infectious diseases, for example, or also social aspects of health, such as exclusion through disease or weak health systems, or also lack of access to medicines in poorer countries. It, currently, in the COVID-19 pandemic, this trend towards global health security is be, being further strengthened. The COVID-19 pandemic has all health policy discussions and measures firmly in its uh, hand, almost a year after first cases occurred in China. Other health concerns also here have been overshadowed by the pandemic, the lockdowns and also the concentration of limited medical resources on the pandemic have disrupted other vital health services. We all know it, for example, vaccination programs no longer take place, there's less, less HIV tra treatment, fewer malaria nets are distributed, and birth assistance are restricted, with far-reaching consequences. This crisis mode seems necessary, though. The pandemic concerns us all. It affects every single one of us. At the same time, we know, however, that it is also clear that the virus has the most drastic effects where it encounters structural preconditions, disease-causing conditions. People who are particularly affected by the pandemic are those who find it difficult to protect themselves from infection due to poor working or also poor living conditions, because they can hardly keep the distance or implement hygiene measures, because they are exposed to health risks due to, for example, malnutrition, and because they have inadequate access to health services, for example, because they cannot pay. For them. Aware of this risk, strict lockdowns have been imposed in many countries all over the world to contain the crisis with drastic secondary effects. People who live from hand to mouth cannot earn the living, cannot earn the daily wages, they cannot feed their families, cannot pay their rents anymore. Social safety nets in which state support protects against loss of income do not exist in most countries of the world. Like COVID today, however, actually also pandemics like the HIV AIDS has already taught us that infections depend not only on genetic predispositions, but especially on social socioeconomic conditions. So it is also that in 2008, the WHO Commission on Social Determinants for, formulated this very clearly. Social justice is a matter of life and death. Inequalities in health arise from the, the circumstances in which people grow, live, work and age. The conditions in which people live are uh, shaped by political, social, economic forces. But also this insight has long been recognized. Global health approaches have so far focused primarily on short-term and technical solutions, such as fighting specific diseases or implementing, for example, single vac vaccination programs. Too little has been done to implement existing concepts, such as primary health care, for example, which aim to provide comprehensive basic care, but also structural development, locally anchored and involving the population. And so what we see also now during the COVID-19 pandemic, most countries' strategies for coping with the epidemic are narrowly defined and rapidly outlined national preparedness and disease control measures, rather than structural prevention, social containment, and comprehensive health policies. Also in this corona pandemic today, the narrative of crisis and war dominates political discourse and action. And as a result, what we see is that vulnerable groups are exposed to ever higher infection and mortality rates. This is why we think it is high time to engage in a broader debate about the pandemic, which will also include contributions from other perspectives and experiences from our honorable speakers today. We are therefore looking forward to hearing from our speakers from the fields of political science, from social epidemiology and comprehensive public health. 
Together with them, we want to examine the concept of global health security in order to understand how it was developed, what impact it has on global health equity, and what criticism is necessary to arrive at better policy alternatives. We ask, are we fighting the virus or do we need to start fighting social vulnerabilities to the virus? Which structural, social and political default settings have shaped the national, regional and global COVID-19 responses? With that, I hand over to my colleague Andreas Wolf from Medico International for the moderation of this session and I wish us all an exciting seminar. Thank you. So now you should hear me again. Wonderful. So thank you, thank you, Marike, for this uh, strong thoughts uh, in the beginning and uh, provocative questions that you put ahead of our panelists and our audience today. And so then, I I'm very happy that we were able to put together um, this panel of speakers that joined us from the different field that, that Marika already said, uh, different fields of uh, academic and practical experiences. Um, so I will briefly introduce you to the speakers and then um, the first, then they, they're going to start. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Anna Römer Mahler. She is currently an associate professor international relations at the University of Sussex in the UK. Before that, she worked as a postdoc at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Anna has worked on issues relating to global health security for the last seven years, first on the role of pharmaceutical technologies in global health security, and more recently on how the idea of global health security has played out in Africa. Um, Happy to have her here on the panel after we had invited her to Berlin already in 2017 on the Ebola, post-Ebola policy developments. So this is a second chance to speak her. Unfortunately, we cannot be, um, couldn't invite all people directly to Berlin. Um, so Anna, please, you have your floor. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas and Mareike, uh, for the introduction and also for inviting me to join uh, this discussion today. I'm really, really pleased um, about having this forum in the sort of everyday um, sort of hectic and trying to deal with everything. It's really nice to have a platform like this to think and step back a bit and think about things uh, in a bit more detail. Um, I'm formulating my, my thoughts here really from the perspective of someone who's interested in, in political processes. Um, political processes by which certain ideas like global health security um, become influential, come to shape policies and practice, but also the political processes that then help to change certain ideas and, and how they sort of um, play out in the world. And I think that this so this is the perspective from which I'm coming to this panel and from which I want to speak about global health security. And I think it's relevant to think about these sort of broader political processes because it can help us sort of reflect a bit more on the context with, within which we think about global health and which within which really we do global health. And I think it's particularly relevant today because of this perspective, because a lot of thinking is currently going on about how the future of global health could look like and should look like um, as the world comes out of the pandemic. And also, I think it's really particularly relevant to look at these broader political processes, um, including at the international level, because it is this context which is undergoing really quite fundamental changes currently. So we are moving from an era in which the United States was the dominant um, and the most powerful country in the world and in, in which there was a quite a, uh, a strong focus of international in international politics on collaboration on international 
collaboration. And we are moving, I feel like, out of this era into an era that is marked by more and more influence from other countries other than the United States, notably China, but not only China, really. Um, we are moving into an era, or we are in, in an era where the United States is withdrawing from international collaboration and where at the same time we see uh, the rise of nationalism uh, in the US, but also in other many other countries. And we see an increasing confrontation between the US and China in, in the world. I'll come back to, to this uh, towards the end of my talk and, and how and to, to sort of how I think this is changing um, the idea of global health security. But perhaps let me start by saying a few words about um, the very idea of global health security and how it emerged in and is really and was tied into a very particular geopolitical context. So essentially, the idea of global health security links the policy fields of health and security. And, and this linkage occurred in the 1990s, first in the United States. Certain health issues, notably infectious diseases with uh, the potential to cause a pandemic, certain health issues became understood increasingly as posing potentially a threat to national security and international security. And, and this thinking uh, and sort of the linking of health and security um, is relevant because it changed the influence that different groups had on the discussion about global health and on the decision-making about global health policies. So speaking about health issue as security threats um, mobilized the attention of groups um, outside the conventional field of, of health. Um, and it mobilized, it really changed sort of the audience to which uh, this discussion was, was directed and brought in groups into the discussion that were not at all uh, primarily concerned with, with health, but with other topics, with other interests, foreign policy issues, national security, obviously, but also part of the business community to which security is, is very relevant. And so linking health with the idea of, of national security changed the, the people that were sort of sitting around the table, the, the people that were part of the discussion on global health. Um, and, and these these groups are foreign policy communities, security communities, business communities are, are very powerful, politically very powerful groups. And it's really not a surprise that the emergence of the idea of global health security is associated then with the increasing political attention that was paid to global health issues in the 1990s and early 2000s. So, you see or we see that at this time health was increasingly discussed not only within ministries of, of health but also um, ministries of, of foreign affairs, uh, trade um, and even at the level of heads of states and we see that not only at the national level but um, we see that also at the international political level so um, in fora like uh, the UN Security Council, the G7, the G20. But Speaking about health as sort of a threat to national or certain health issues, potential threat to national securities, that wasn't just a, like a strategic move, an instrumental move in order to get more attention and get the attention from, from other more powerful players. But linking health and security really also was uh, the result of a new understanding, changing understanding of what national and, and international security uh, is all about. And this new understanding or this changing understanding in the 1990s, what national security and international security are all about, that is tied in the particular geopolitical context at the time. So in the, in the early 1990s, in the 1990s. Um, and there are sort of three phenomena I just want to highlight here briefly. Um, it's firstly the end of the Cold War at the time. So the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War between the US and their allies and, and the Soviet Union and their allies. It's the ex accelerating globalization at the time. And then the dominance of the United States as the most powerful state in the world. So let me just say a few words on, on this. So in the early 1990s, when the Soviet Union had collapsed as and, and sort of the main enemy for the United States, 
where this linking of health and security really took place, um, that triggered uh, a reconsideration of what the United States national security was about and uh, opened the space, the security space up for considerations that went beyond this sort of immediate military confrontation with, with another state, with the Soviet Union. And this thinking happened at a time when globalization was accelerating massively, driven by technological change. We see sort of more and more people, goods, but also information travel the globe at sort of quite ever increasing uh, pace. And this experience of accelerating globalization that fed into this new thinking about security and uh, defined what then became known as the new security challenges. And those were things like environmental problems, um, migration, cybersecurity, and also health. So what I want to say here is that the idea of global health security emerged really as part of a wider reflection and reconsideration of what national security and international security was about uh, in this new geopolitical context. But what is important really to highlight here is that not all countries experience this new geopolitical context in the same way. So the, the end of the Cold War had massive um, uh, security implications for the United States and also for Western European countries who were so close geographically to the uh, Soviet Union. Um, but it didn't have the same massive security implications for many other countries in the world whose security and national security was much more embedded in, uh, in sort of regional dynamics, national dynamics, local dynamics. And equally, if you think about globalization, um, yes, it's sort of in a way a global phenomenon, but it's, it wasn't and still isn't felt in the same way by all countries and societies in the world. And especially at the time, it's really the, it was really the largest economies in the world um, that were the main participants in sort of this accelerating globalization. So what I want to highlight here is that first, the idea of global health security and how it sort of came about was very much tied into a particular geopolitical context, but that this context was not a global context, that this context was experienced and interpreted including in terms of its security implications, quite differently by different states and different organizations. And the notion of global health security, the idea that then sort of became quite influential in the 1990s and 2000s, really reflects the particular perspective and interpretation of this new uh, uh, context from the perspective of the United States and some of its major um, allies. And, and this is really not to say in any way that, or to pass a judgment about whether global health security in the sort of shape and form it took, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, or whether the practices that emerge from it are good or bad. That's not the point I'm trying to make. Um, I'm just trying to, to link it to, the per, to a particular geopolitical context and to how this context was interpreted by a particular group of, of countries. And the fact that it became dominant then or became so influential internationally is, is again linked to the US being the dominant country in the world at this time, who was then able to, uh, through their own foreign policy, spread this notion of global health security, um, first among sort of allied countries and organizations and, and then also into international organizations. So to move to how these reflections sort of are relevant for, for today. Essentially, what I wanted to highlight is that global health security is the result not only of changes in the way we think about health, but it's also the result of changes uh, in the way that states and organizations have come to think about security. And to really highlight that security and national security are not kind of fixed ideas, but that they change over time and they change also across states and societies. And what also changes is whose security considerations become influential in international politics. And that's where we think we're seeing a lot of change currently. So the way that security is defined by many governments today and also other social groups 
that sort of understanding of security is moving away from, uh, from a focus on globalization and interdependence. But we see more and more that ideas of, of the nation, of self-sufficiency, of decoupling, deglobalization, that sort of these ideas shape the security discourse in, in many, many countries. And obviously, particularly uh, visible in the United States, but really also in many other places, including in China. And in this sort of changing geopolitical context, I think it's increasingly difficult to work with an idea that seeks to square the notion of global and security, that seems to wants to bring them together. But it's not only it's sort of the increasing nationalism that we see, but it's also that we really see a more diversified group of, of organizations and states having an impact and influence in international politics. So the BRICS countries, as we've sort of long seen, but also really a lot of other countries, middle powers, whose perceptions and, and understandings of security um, um, shape, uh, shape the debate. And also of regional organizations, of the African Union, of ASEAN, and of regional public health organizations like the Africa CDC, for example. So all this, I think, may, means that we are seeing a change in the way that uh, global health security is, is, is thought of and practiced. So I mean, to conclude what I guess my sort of main message or my main sort of concern at the moment, my, my interest is that when we start to think about global health and how global health should and can emerge out of this pandemic, that we need to be aware that the wider parameters of this discussion um, are changing and that we should not simply assume that these sort of discussions, these conversations will take place within broadly the same ideas and the same institutions and among the same actors that have shaped and sort of formed the backbone of, of global health and global health governance in, in the last 20, 30 years. Okay, I'll close here. Thank you. Great, great, Anne. Thank you very much for a lot of, uh, a lot of thoughts for us. I already see that in the chat there are um, questions coming up. For this, Jorge uh, Lieber van Heteren is asking whose change is actually uh, relevant, uh, if I understood her right. And uh, if we are still looking into these debates in a very way of also thinking about the traditional powers to be. Uh, but maybe Jorge Lieber, you can put your questions or comments also a bit more in detail. Uh, before we move to the next, um, the next speaker, is there any questions for clarifications that you would like to put to Anna in the chat? I don't see. No, there's currently no no questions okay. for clarification. Okay, thanks, thanks, Marika. So then, then I suggest we move on to Iris. Let me see where is my, now I have too many papers here. Dr. Iris Jutzek. I'm very happy to have her. She, uh, different from Anna Rimamala, we didn't know before, so we are happy to, to have you here. Is she's currently an associate professor in critical urban geography at the University of Münster in Germany. She's interested in how geographies of power and knowledge shape cities, health, and governance. In her recent work, she engages with worlding as a strategy to rethink health from below and from elsewhere. She has published on urban health equity and the social environmental construction of COVID-19. So this is a I think for many of us who are more traditionally working in coming from the public health field, that might be very new and exciting uh, concepts that, that I'm happy to ask Iris to explore for us a bit more. Welcome, Iris. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I, I will start right now. Um, we are at the war with the virus, stated the French President Emmanuel Macron in March 2020 over and over again. And around the same time, Chinese Vice Premier Sun Chulan said Wuhan faced wartime conditions. 
warning that there must be no deserters or they will be nailed to the pillar of historical shame forever. <laughs> Christian Drosten, one of the world leading virologists, called the spread of COVID-19 a natural disaster in slow motion. Framing COVID-19 in terms of war and disaster has tangible consequences. It turns combat, eradication, discipline and coercion into adequate responses to the virus. These ramifications can be witnessed in many countries, lockdowns, dust to dawn curfews and punishment by fines. As Anna Roma Mahler has demonstrated in her talk, global health security has evolved as the dominant mode of governance in the post-Cold War era. It is liberal, authoritarian in character and frames health as a national problem. It prioritizes critical infrastructure and civil defense over universal health care for everybody. My point here is neither to say that these measures are wrong, nor that they are not effective. Instead, I would like to make the case that framing COVID-19 as enemy and as disaster disarticulates other ways of coping with the current epochal crisis. And these other ways of dealing with pandemics are crucial not only for fighting the virus, but also for solving, for, for solving the root causes that transformed COVID-19 into a deadly pandemic. The thoughts I present today are not my own, <laughs> but they result from a collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Henning Füller at Humboldt University of Berlin. I want to introduce three shifts in framing and thinking about COVID-19. The first shift from enemy to social causes of disease. Second, from natural disaster to a social ecology of disease. And third, from health security to health solidarity. These shifts will make clear why governing through global health secu security alone will not manage the current crisis and why we need a new politics of life that is based on solidarity instead. So first, from enemy to social causes of disease. Framing the virus SARS-CoV-2 as enemy conceals that the roots of COVID are social. Critical social ep epidemiology offers a helpful pers perspective to understand these social causes. We owe the pers perspective of critical social epidemiology almost exclusively to colleagues from Latin America. It has evolved from a bottom-up health movement into a pan-Latin American scholar activist perspective. Instead of focusing on isolated pathogens, it draws attention to the structural preconditions that make bodies and communities vulnerable. It asks how poverty, unemployment, exclusion or racism affect health. It analyzes the social relations that create poverty, bad working conditions and sort people accord, according to their skin color or their income. According to this perspective, it is not the virus alone that kills but social and economic inequality as well. Diabetes, obesity or immune system diseases are normally seen as personal problems or as wrong behavior patterns that increase vulnerability to COVID-19. Critical social epidemiology reminds us that these additional risks are unequally distributed along the lines of race and class. Recent studies show the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on black people and people of color, for example, in the USA. The interlocking powers of nationalism, racism, xenophobia, and capitalism make the virus for some people deadlier than for others. This is why coping with COVID-19 must include fighting social inequality as well. Second, from natural disaster to a social ecology of disease, Framing COVID-19 as a natural disaster obscures that the current crisis is not natural at all. Instead, the environmental relations that turn the virus into a disaster are human-made. This is what we call a social ecology of disease. The human virome is the total collection of viruses in and on the human body. Not many of these viruses are lethal or, or threaten human health. Being healthy does not simply mean being free from pathogens. Instead, it is a matter of immunocompetence. That is, the ability to live with a variety of other organisms. 
industrial monocropping, intense livestock breeding, and the constant expansion of capitalist production into ecosystems have reduced human have reduced immun immunocompetence <laughs> dramatically. And the accelerated speed of global production and circulation makes zoonoses like COVID-19 or Ebola to evolve into a global threat much more qu quickly. From the perspective of social ecology, viruses transform into enemies and into disasters through these complex socio-ecological socio relations. Coping with a virus requires to restructure the social and economic production of nature. Cultivating plants and animals in all their natural variety and removing plants and animal breeding from industrial property protection may be first step into this direction. From health security to health solidarity. Framing the virus-sized COVID-2 as an enemy and as a national security problem neglect the power of people to collectively develop strategies in order to fight the virus, virus to co cope with it and to stay safe. We cannot overcome the current crisis without the power of communities. And I think this is what, for, what is forgot in health, uh, global health security a little bit. How can find fighting against the virus be also a form of acting in solidarity? There is an answer to this question, but I think it's dispersed around the world. Be it SARS in Asia, Zika in Latin America or Ebola in Africa, grassroots health initiatives around the world have long gathered experiences with dealing, um, grassroots initiatives around the world have gathered experiences of dealing with deadly infectious disease all around the world. We can learn from these experiences how to best sustain our social, economic and political webs of life while at the same time maintaining physical distance. Health and environmental activists worldwide have stressed the importance of respecting human rights, securing primary health care, fighting stigma and environmental expo exploitation for successfully dealing with viruses globally. They understand health as structurally political and advocate for strengthening participatory justice and health equity. I call this bringing together of globally dispersed local knowledge worlding. Worlding aims at encouraging more people to engage in their health issues collectively, especially in the global north. Health policies that result from self-organization and that are based on solidarity create the fundamental conditions of well-being all over the world and especially in times of COVID-19. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Iris. This is a lot, a lot of really exciting thinking, bringing us to issues of uh, intersectionality passing by the debates on IP and patent, and then ending in the perspective of uh, health solidarity and the perspectives from experience from people from below that also our third speaker will focus on. Um, again, if there are immediate questions under, of understanding, of comprehension, is there any for Iris at the moment? It doesn't look like it doesn't look like no, okay no so, but i but i'm uh, i'm happy i think as 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 uh, we have more time then to bring this together into perspective um after our after our in intervention three intervention so i'm very happy and i think it it really uh, closes very easily to the last presentations that uh, what Dr. Rene Lovenson is going to give us. She's an epidemiologist and the director of training and research support center in Zimbabwe. She has uh, since 1980 implemented research, participatory action research, policy analysts, training and mentoring of work, and has led various international research consortia on equity in health, social determinants on health and health systems, and social participation in health, on health policy, 
change in family and child health and well-being and on public health law and practice. She is a founding member of Equinet, which is a network of health activists and health politics people in the southern and eastern African region. And she coordinates also the Shaping Health Consortium and has been a member and a chair of various national and global bodies on health. And I'm also very proud to say that um, Equinet is also a partner of Medico International and we have supported their work over the past couple of years, particular on health consequences on extractive industries in the region of Southern and Eastern Africa. So thank you, René, that you can be with us today. You see also René shortly in the video. We were not sure if the, the, the bandwidth of the internet would allow this, and maybe you want to stop it again. So to make sure, but try, maybe maybe it's working, ready. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Andreas. And uh, thanks everybody for joining and for the discussions, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, so I'm, I'm going to focus on this whole idea of reclaiming comprehensive public health. And I guess one of the questions or one of the reasons why this is critical in any discussion on global health security is what kind of health paradigm are we bringing to the table in these kind of discussions and in responding to, to, to challenges like COVID um, and other challenges. And this is because we are public health practitioners in various ways. And so we have a responsibility and not just to analyze these discussions, but actually to influence them um, and to be and to be public health activists around them. So that's my perspective. And I think what we're seeing in COVID-19 pandemic responses is, is a long-standing tension in public health between pathogenic biosecurity, biomedical approaches to health um, that tend to objectify people as the problem. Um, and on the other hand, more comprehensive social determinants, participatory and rights-based approaches to health where people are subjects in their lives and they play a critical role in determining and taking action. And I think we've seen that in COVID-19, for example, and elsewhere, that if you take actions, if you focus too extremely in this coercive top-down biosecurity focus, it affects public health in the longer term. And not acting on social determinants is not effective for public health. So let me just elaborate a little bit on that. And I need to make it very clear that public health as the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health is not a matter for the health sector. It's through the organized efforts of society. And it's not focused on the absence of disease, but it's focused on promoting health and well-being. And so biosecurity is not equal to public health. And I think that often gets forgotten at times like this. And the other thing is that We've had over 2000 years of debate between pathogenic models and, and an understanding, a much wider understanding of health and well being based on material and non material dimensions. Actually, some of these ecological perspectives that are being <clears throat> somewhat newly discovered in, in northern countries um, really existed prior to colonialism in many, many southern countries in Latin America in Africa, in Asia, and, and health was seen to be a consequence of social relations and reciprocity. So for example, if in Zimbabwe, I say to you, how are you in, in Shona, the answer will come back, I'm fine if you are fine. And then my answer is, I'm fine if you are fine. So there was a notion that your social relations determines your health, and that it is a collective interest, not a private individual interest. But we've seen these biomedical um, pathogenic approaches become more dominant with the scientific development of germ theory and, and so on. I mean, and they have had significant effects in disease reduction. Um, but I think we also have to realize that they played a, a, a very dominating role in public health, in colonialism, in, in, in a very, in what we are seeing now, suddenly discovering in high income countries um, as being coercive and punitive approaches 
that was the history of how modern medicine entered into colonial um, in colonialism into Africa and in other settings. And I think Anne has captured that quite quite well in the in its in its trajectory globally. Uh, in the same way as we witnessed how structural adjustment programs in the South suddenly became quite harsh austerity experiences in the North, we are now seeing this pathogenic approach being used in the North that has a very long history in colonial countries, in countries that were colonized. But I do need to say that that contrasts with the holistic participatory rights-based and determinants-based lens that has also emerged in the last century in comprehensive primary health care, in social medicine, in social determinants approaches, and in thinking about planetary health, um, such as Iris has described. So um, as we look at this in relation to the, to, the, to the COVID pandemic, the problem we see as, a public, as public health practitioners is the dominance of, of, of the practice and of the reporting and documentation of these centralized top-down responses that concentrate executive power. Perhaps talking a bit to Godley's point about whose power is being, is, being re, is being amplified in this sort of public health approach. We're seeing military power as Iris raised. We're seeing executive power, um, but we're also seeing private corporate power. For example, in, in private corporations that are taking on public roles, such as in tracking and tracing and building a digital population monitoring. Um, and these things are happening at a time of contradiction with other forms of social power. So while, while some of these forms of power have grown, we've seen people experiencing loss of income, food insecurity, solitude, dying alone, mental health problems, discontinuity of other health services for other health conditions, gender violence, prolonged exclusion from schooling, all of which not only widen social inequalities, but also have an implication for the atomization and the disempowerment of society. We've also seen public health ministries lose control over the pandemic to security sectors in some countries, and even to privatization in other countries, and responses that are based more on public fear, obedience and coercion than solidarity and informed action. And digital monitoring has taken place because the internet is a very powerful form of of, of, um, of transaction in the world today, but without considering the implications of this vast amount of health data being stored by entities that are not under public control. So it's important to say that in public health, yes, there is an understanding of the limitation of rights, individual rights when collective interest is at stake, but there are well-established principles that have been set by the UN, such as the Syracuse principles that, that establish under what conditions and with what precautions this can happen. And I think if we had the time, I would go into these and basically say that there is concern that we are not, we are not necessarily in compliance with these principles in some of our actions on COVID. However, I need to move on because I think the negative picture that we're getting is a dominant picture. It's also a disempowering picture. And what we're not getting and we're not hearing enough of and we've just published 42 case studies demonstrating this other picture is something that's happening at grassroots levels in all countries, north and south, and to some extent in states and local government areas and countries um, across the world, but to a lesser extent, I should say, but mainly at grassroots level. Our more com comprehensive, participatory, community-engaged public health responses to COVID. Um, and I think we're not listening to these enough. We're not documenting them enough. And as a result, we're not engaging them with as a source of power to inform paradigms when we come into these global discussions. And they're there. We've seen investments in local organization, in innovations for prevention, in support of migrants returning in Mozambique and Malawi, in, in, in dialogue on how to design public health measures so that they work for particular faith-based communities in Burkina Faso, in community health worker and local community activist support for service outreach in Kerala and Uganda and Western Syria, even in conflict zones, uh, linking with diaspora communities uh, in Brazil, building on investments made through the SUS in, in community councils, 
Um, we've seen community networks supporting food, shelter, clothing, and other needs, such as in the community action networks in South Africa, but also in, in many, many, many countries. Um, we've seen things like the outbreak of generosity campaign um, that youth have, have embarked on in Europe through digital means to, to support local communities with shopping, with needs, etc., cetera, um, and, and to, to, to provide empathic support to people in hospitals who are isolated. And this kind of reflects a practice that co-constructs responses with those affected and makes them therefore more effective, more feasible. And they also show a compassionate society that isn't contradictory to public health. It actually enhances public health. And we can see it in the difference in the way digital platforms are used, that they communicate and organize and link people um, to prevention and care and support services. They share experiences. They organize solidarity networks or they identify risk environments and how they could be improved. And they act on multiple pathways. They don't locate only on the biomedical aspect of COVID, but they deal with all the various things that are affecting health, both psychosocial and material. They engage whole of society, they engage collective interest, and they, 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 they express the production relations that we're trying to argue at global level about global public goods, for example, in connecting food producers, local food producers with households to overcome food supply shortages um, during times of, of lockdowns and so on. And why we need things like pooled patenting, because we can see from these responses that distributed production, not just access, but distributed production is critical for public health of essential health technologies. So. I, and I think I would like to reinforce what Ira said, is that comprehensive public health response doesn't stop at reacting. It goes to prevention. And we know these underlying structural determinants that are causing pandemics like, go, like COVID in the intensified monocropping, factory farming, extractive activities um, that are really generating the intensity of, of animal to human interaction and, and, and squeezing animals into smaller and smaller areas that are part of our overall biodiversity crisis that, that is inherent within the climate change public health threats. So as a bottom line, we need to push back. We need to talk about the kind of public health practice and public mindsets that doesn't turn us into biosecurity atomized, objectified aid, um, responses to what is done at higher levels of power. And we need to protect and advance a public health that's rooted in public interest, that's proactive, that's effective, that's participatory, that's principled, that's just, that's based on scientific and social evidence, and that acts upstream on the social determinants of health, and that builds cooperation within and across countries globally. We cannot allow a security agenda to define health or health security. We have to allow a comprehensive public health agenda to do that. And in doing that, we need to listen more to what's coming up from, from the South. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much, I now have an echo. I hope you're not. Do you hear me clearly? No, that's better now. Thank you very much. This was a very, very powerful statement. And uh, I just realized that I didn't, uh, in my introduction, uh, I, I told you why we are doing this. You all know this. But of course, we are doing this um, to tackle issues that are not being spoken about at the World Health Summit that is taking place at the moment. So this is, I think, uh, all of your presentations were perfectly uh, making the point of this idea that, that we had with the seminar to say, okay, it's necessary to speak um, about issues that are not, uh, that, that, that move beyond this biomedical uh, paradigm that, that, that is basically informing the World Health Summit at the moment. Um, but let me see if uh, Marika has some questions from the floor immediately to Rene. No, there's no questions uh, of clarification in the moment. Yeah, okay. I see one question. No, that's from, a question for But people. this is more for both. I, uh, okay, no, that's, that's fine. That's fine. It was very clear. And I think these uh, three 
presentations really put together um, uh, might make a, make a very good point already. What what I would like to ask now, and of course it's only a virtual panel that we could put together uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis, but I, I would like to encourage our three panelists to see if they have an immediate question to one of the other panelists or if they want to respond to some points that they have heard from the other panelists. So to start the discussion on the panel and then we move on to the contributions from the floor. So Anne, Iris and Rene, who wants to speak on what you have heard from the others? Anne? Anne, you switched off. Yeah. Your, okay, go, go ahead, Anne. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, it's it's not really um, a question. I'm still sort of trying to uh, phrase it in my my own mind. So, but one thing, I mean, that comes comes up quite clearly from uh, from the uh, from Iris and, and and Rene, and it's also a topic that has sort of been preoccupying me just by watching what's happening in the COVID response. Is the how sort of the the community sits in this broader global health. Um, uh, global health security idea or, or response, and um, and th I mean, there's is, is, uh, there's clearly um, a, a lack of uh, of community involvement. While on the other hand, a lot of my public health colleagues, and I'm, I really must stress, I'm not from the public health community myself at all. This is not my background and my expertise. But listening to colleagues from public health field, I hear a lot of them emphasizing the importance of community in uh, designing responses, in de developing um, test and trace systems, in, uh, in taking a, a more holistic perspective on the pandemic and, and how to respond with it. But nevertheless, there seems to be a difficulty of this global health security thinking to engage with the community. And, and sort of, I have a question, I'm wondering why that is. And um, like one, thinking I have is, uh, is it goes in the direction that this when I frame an issue health or any other issue really in in this in a context of security I introduce the sense of of urgency and emergency and, and crisis and and I also introduce this sort of sense of the need for it for quick response um, and I guess with that comes a um, um, sort of a tendency to to prioritize solutions that are that are centralized, that are can sort of come in quite quickly and, and sort of feel that they can be sort of coordinated in a, in a more top down way. And I think also uh, like a, um, like a, a like a priority prioritization of, of sort of more technological responses. Um, and I think in that context the attention to community which always means also diversity and always means sort of greater complexity is, is probably quite difficult to reconcile with the with the, with the security framing um but i would like be interested to hear what Rene and iris thought about about this how community and security sort of sit together um but on the other hand we have also seen i think especially post ebola more attention to community focus in, in some of the response. I mean, I see a lot more of my my colleagues from especially anthropology working now in and on sort of pandemic preparedness. Um, and I see also the community, the community health worker making a much more sort of prominent appearance in, in a lot of the um, sort of public health discourse or global health discourse. Um, so yeah, that's sort of this, this, this sort of community and global health security Problematic is something that I'm uh, I'd be really interested in, and also how perhaps there is more space within the current framing and the way that the global health security framing is changing, where Rene and Iris think there might be ways to push this community idea uh, in this situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Anne. Um, Rene or Iris, you want to? Iris, you want. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but I would like to prolong the question that Anna posed um, in the direction to Rene, be, um, because
because I think we, we made clear some approaches that, that we want to see and that we think we are important in a more bottom-up perspective, um, a more south-centered um, perspective um, on the current um, challenges that we meet. Um, uh, but what I would like to ask is um, the question that we have also in the outline, um, what options lie ahead for a multipolar world? So, so what structures can we build from this more localized community um, um, level, um, perhaps into not a global, but a translocal frame um, that informs also perhaps Europe, which has not much experiences with um, infectious disease? René, yeah. you, you showed up, so won't you? <laughs> you, you can also ask, ask your fellow panelists. Yes, yes. Oh. So um, just, just to, can I respond to those questions? Sure. Um, so, so I think that um, the, the, the listening to communities and the emergency of the pandemic coming into the same kind of like uh, situation, um, one of the things we found is that whether it's planned from above or implemented from below, communities are responding. And they are responding in Europe and in Africa and in Latin America. I mean, there is, there is response taking place. And, and actually, these responses are, in some cases, transforming production relations. People are becoming producers or are making direct links um, in ways that are cutting out middlemen and so on and so forth. So things are changing on the ground. Um, the question about how far it gets connected into the state's response, the local government response, or, or even into the civil society organized responses, what, what, what I have a sense is that to what extent has there been an investment on this in the past and to what extent is it dependent on um, a sudden crisis response in a moment. And I, and I think that the experiences that we've seen is that organizations that have worked more holistically, that have worked on some of these more comprehensive approaches in the past, or, or local governments that have created these mechanisms in the past, or have invested in the past in these sorts of areas, have been much more capable of responding more quickly, of, of switching process, of generating interaction of being innovative and creative. So the, the question that I have then is to what extent a global health security agenda actually is taking us away from the investments that we need to be making in a longer term sense to build the capacity to respond to crisis, in addition, of course, to preventing crisis. And, and, and are we not being driven increasingly in the same way as we were driven from comprehensive primary health care to selective primary health care by agendas that say these investments are too expensive, they're too infeasible, they're too time consuming, they're too problematic. Let's be more reactive when the problem arises rather than let's invest in well-being in our political economies, in our society. So I think it's, I think that I worry about the global health security agenda sometimes because I think it's driving us into very short term capabilities rather than longer term responses and therefore into continuing cyclical crises. And I think communities are engaged by by much by a different kind of system which engages them before the crisis, not just at the moment of crisis. I don't know if I'm making sense. Um, and I think it resonates a bit with what you were saying, Iris, about, about looking to the causes and, and working in these areas, but also doing that kind of work in a more participatory manner, um, in, in a more social, health in a more social determinants driven manner, uh, right from before crises and to prevent crises. And I, my question really then is to the others, is, is there a risk in global health security domination of a, of a global health agenda of, of moving us towards very short term reactive responses to health rather than the longer term thinking we need to address the political economy and the paradigms affecting health. Hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rene. How Iris, Anne, you want to respond immediately? 
Yeah, maybe just to yeah. briefly um, to, uh, to that. I mean, uh, in answer to Renee's question, I think the answer is unequivocally. I think I'm not sure. That it's, it's definitely yes. Um, and I think the global the, the sort of security framing is taking uh, thinking and responses away from long term uh, long term consideration, and that's sort of one of the main points that are critical critiques that um, myself, colleagues, and many others have made on the agenda, that it's essentially you're, you're ending, there's a danger of ending up in the cycle of crisis and neglect, so super attention and then nothing. And but we've seen that with a lot of health sort of crises in the, in the past. Um, and I think that's also something that's been much more widely recognized now. And even in sort of more conventional sort of global health institutions, I see, for example, the attempt to push universal health coverage agenda uh, as sort of almost like the other side of the coin to global health security as an attempt to to speak to these concerns, whether that's um, a, whether that's going to be successful or whether that's going to be address the problems, I, I don't know, but. I think we see a, a more, much more widely, uh, much more widely a recognition of this problem, um, and maybe also another point I think that's really important and also has been written about a lot um, with regards to the problems of global health security is that it takes health out of society if you if you want, and that a lot of health issues, as we you've sort of discussed and, and showed so 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 well, are really. Um, part and parcel of wider social dynamics and inequalities. Um, and I think, again, that this, this debate has also it's been picked up. I mean, I think this whole like emphasis on one health and multi-sectoral approaches tries to speak to this. Um, so I really see the global health security ad agenda under, uh, yeah, undergoing changes. Uh, and as you say, I said in your in your in your in your talk, uh, Rene, um, I mean, a lot of these ideas are really old, and ideas in, in international politics they come and go and become dominant and fade away, and that's partly a result of sort of broader power changes. And I think that's happening with global health security as well. I recently, after a couple of years, spoken to quite a few people who said global health security agenda is on its way out. That ship has sailed. Uh, we are moving into a new. Year sort of paradigm. Um, so yeah, I think you, you, uh, these points you're making uh, made a, a really important stop here. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks all of you. I think it's high time now to to uh, listen to our audience because I, I've seen already with one eye that there are quite a number of good interventions on the in the chat. So Marika, please, please put them together put them to the panelists thanks okay i do my best uh, so i see agreement um to many things that have been said and i see comments also but i would like to uh, raise uh, those um, questions that have been um, put here and um i would like to start with uh, with the question or comment which has been put by uh Godelieve van hetteren all already in the beginning you might have seen it already and she's saying the ways um, changes or trends are discussed in the world are more specifically in global health are not neutral, but the product of power relations and the hierarchies of assigning importance. And she's asking, could this particular moment in history be used to address these fundamentals of power, agency and agenda setting powers first before blindly adopting the terms in which the changes are being expressed by some? So, um, yeah, this is a question I think for, for all of you. And um, a little bit related to that uh, are two questions focusing on the landscape in which act, global health actors are in or also on the um, certain roles of global health actors. There's a question from Ramco van der Pass um, to Anne uh, directly and uh, he's asking, arguing, Ulrich Beck would argue that this would this uh, world risk might provide provide space to elaborate new shared responsibilities, uh, new shared responsibility approaches by states and other actors. How do you see this pandemic momentum for getting there? Um, 
And then David McCoy was uh, asking uh, more specifically on global health actors. A lot of what has been presented concerns the framing of both COVID-19 as well as the way we frame our response to COVID-19. Which global health actors are doing good, a good job of framing COVID-19 in a more thoughtful or holistic manner? Spe specifically, how well have the following actors been doing? WHO Global, WHO Afro, Gates Foundation, and CDC USA, which national governments are doing a good job. So uh, maybe you can refer to that. And I would also raise another question from uh, Richard Hartlaub. It's specifically to Iris. When do you think the global health security framing started to become dominant over social epidemiology framing in the COVID-19 pandemics? He remembers um, he was attending a conference and it was still quite clearly focused on social epidemiology. Is this a function of the pandemic moving westwards and to the global, global north? So I would leave it here. These were the questions until now. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mareike. A lot to say, a lot to answer. Who wants to start? Any any hands up? Iris, maybe? Yeah, thanks for the brilliant, yeah. brilliant questions. Perhaps I would start um, to answer the question that was directed to, to me. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's an important intervention you make. Um, of course, it's, it, it cannot be um, but it cannot be the aim to play out one approach against the other. And I think we can be um, very um, happy um, that um, not everything is framed um, in the terms of um, health security and um, pandemic preparedness. But I think um, perhaps um, the way I framed my, um, my intervention is, 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 of course, is especially a position which comes from the, the global north. And I think here, um, it's, it's very important um, to make the point that um, thinking in health in terms of security and risk um, really comes um, at a high cost. And um, uh, to, to make clear um, that, that a lot of, lot of things are disarticulated, which are really, really important to, um, to overcome this crisis. Um, and I think criminalization is never a good um, idea with dealing with health. So. Um, it's more to make the point and that we need more of that and not that it's that it's gonna completely in the di um, wrong direction i would say so thank you for that um, intervention mm -hmm. thank you um anna or oh, renee how do you feel anna um yeah i'm still grappling with Remco's question of this sort of um whether this moment is uh, providing opportunities for a sort of redefinition or rethinking of shared responsibilities. Um, I, I mean, I think um, maybe it's just my general state of mind, but I'm actually not particularly optimistic uh, about that at the moment. Um, partly because I wonder who the, like, who those shared responsibilities sort of always refer to as some kind of community, and uh, I'm not and, and sort of my, for my my sort of um, what I look at, what I research is sort of the international like international relations, international community, and I see at the moment here um, um, a falling apart of what we used to refer to as the international community and sort of various um, forms of collaboration emerging um, around sort of some sort of mod existing multilateral institutions, including WHO, um, around sort of with support from um, European countries, uh, some big philanthropic players. Um, and then I see uh, collaborations more at the regional level in, in, perhaps in, in sort of in Africa and Asia. But then I see also tendencies to sort of split sort of the world into collaborations that are centered around the US and then others that are more centered around China. Um, and I think this sort of emergence of sort of, of this sort of patchwork um, 
then raises the question, yes, perhaps within these groups, there will be uh, this sort of space for redefinition of shared responsibilities. But I'm concerned about this, uh, what we used to refer to as this global space, um, where, where that sort of can, can emerge or, or, or um, exist. Um, perhaps actually, I mean, one area that I think is really quite interesting and to, to watch is sort of more scientific collaborations. I think where that's perhaps a way of, of um, uh, working together across those divides. And also uh, sort of what I think you said it earlier, Iris, in your talk, whether sort of there's, or, or Rene, I don't remember, but whether there's space for more um, networks of, uh, of different local actors or community actors. Um, but yeah, so at the moment, I, I'm a bit pessimistic um, about the space for new shared responsibilities. I'll leave it here. Thanks. Thanks, Anne. Even if it's uh, pessimistic, maybe Rene can put some <laughs> some other color to it. But uh, but now don't feel don't feel pushed. You you. Yeah. No, I'm happy to be less pessimistic. Um, so, <clears throat> um, in terms of David's question about which global actors are or which regional actors are kind of embracing a more comprehensive view. Um, I think it's quite difficult to assign it to an institution. I think that in some, because these global institutions are made up of very mixed paradigms, even internally in what they're promoting. But I would say that, for example, the constant call from WHO for solidarity and collective interests is positive and important on the other hand, I would say that the fact that um, that WHO has been somewhat sidelined in the discussions around essential health technologies being basically public goods in a pandemic, and and also <clears throat> perhaps not being as proactive as it could be in advancing the proposal made by Costa Rica for pooled patenting to allow distributed production it's disappointing. So <clears throat> on the one hand, you know, I'm, I'm applauding WHO. And on the other hand, I'm concerned about WHO not adequately protecting public health. So I think it's quite difficult to say this institution has done marvelously. And at country level, I think we've got, <clears throat> we've got interesting examples like um, within countries, but for me, it's more within countries like, like states like Kerala in India, who have done very interesting work and have built on a history of engaging with social movements um, to, to respond and also learned from prior, prior pandemics. Um, and I think we've seen quite successful responses in, in, in East and Southern Africa in, in settings like Mauritius, where they've got very strong outreach already built in and have been doing work on social determinants and so on. Um, or, or like I said, in South Africa, where there is already strong social networking that is immediately mobilized into these community action networks because they were there because of treatment activism, they were there because of primary healthcare activism, people's health movement activism, and so on. So I, I find it quite difficult to say this country is the model, but I think we have many examples. And I guess one of the points that I really feel quite strongly about is, is how we connect these examples across regions because and i think there have been some interesting experiences of that um for example i was i was interested to find that a, a social network i'm trying to remember the name of it um uh, in in latin america uh, to connect people around care responses and map and map support and also give visibility to the way people are managing COVID in 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 local government areas actually drew its its software from Ushahidi, which is an online platform in Kenya that was developed to map um, responses to electoral abuses. So we're starting, what, I'm, what I guess I'm saying is we're starting to see a new kind of global. We're seeing a global that creates the world from below. And it really struck me profoundly in how much this is starting to emerge around food, um, but also around some of the biodiversity issues around climate. And, and I think that if we're not sensitive to that around pandemics like COVID, 
we are missing the change that's happening from below. We think that it's all happening top down, but it's not. And and time is not on my side to really explain all of that. But I think um, some of these case studies are on that on that document that I think Andreas put there. Um, we need to we need to be aware of this, where where intellectual property is not simply something that's constructed from an, on top, but it's also claimed from below um, in recreating these global relationships. Thank you, thank you, Rene. That's uh, a bit of the more optimistic side. That to 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 look carefully where to find also reason for optimism. Um, I, I would like to hand over to Marike again for more questions, comments from the floor, and please use the chat. We have quite a bit of time still, so yeah, Marike. Yes, thank you. There are two more uh, questions I would like to uh, read out, and I would also remember, uh, like to remember to the question of Dave McCoy on the role of uh, the different global health actors. So, if any one of you would uh, wants to refer to that, then we have two questions. Uh, one is from Suzanne Bergner. She's asking to Anna uh, if the international community is fallen apart. Apart, what do you think of the concept of regional worlds? And do you think this might be the new level of cooperation? And Christoph de Costa uh, was asking um, a question referring to the climate emergency. To what extent is the global health security agenda also evolving towards more attention for the climate emergency? In global health, it seems it mainly focused on the risk for further pandemics, one health, uh, for example, the concept of one health, but the risk of catastrophic climate climate change and vicious feedback loops seems to still get less attention, including from global health security. Is this also the case uh, for the military, foreign affairs, and so on communities where security is top of mind? So, and I have a look into the into the chat, but there's no other question. So I give back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marike. Thank you. Thank you. Question uh, the audience. Um, Anna, I think someone, one question was directed to you directly. Maybe you want to yes. go on this. Thank you, Andreas. And uh, thank you, Suzanne, for the, the question. Um, but the regional world, sort of the centers for collaboration, um, I think there's definitely more health collaboration um, happening here, and and I, the only regions I have, no, uh, uh, at least so as far as what I see in in, in Europe, definitely in, in Africa, but also in in, in Asia, um, I know very little about Latin America, um, and I think yeah, there, there was, we we. In the course of the pandemic, and probably also as a result, we'll probably see more more efforts to collaborate here. Um, but also, some of that has started before. And what I would highlight, though, as far as I I can see these dynamics, um, they are not only and perhaps not even primarily driven by health concerns, but that at least uh, a very strong driver in our, our trade relations and um, sort of changes in those trade relations and attempt to sort of create uh, more change in, in trade. And um, and again, that means that sort of going back to something I, I was trying to bring across or get across in, in my talk is that a lot of what, what uh, Ha has happened um, and historically in, in terms of health collaboration was not driven only and sometimes not even primarily by by health concerns and by sort of health evidence for for best health practice but by by trade relations and um, and I think these trade dynamics will also shape um, collaborations um, on health in at the, at the sort of regional level um, in, in Africa that's that's very very clear with the Africa CDC operating also in the context of uh, very strong attempts of the African Union to create greater continental economic integration. 
And also, if you look at what's recently um, happening around in, in Asia, um, I think we're seeing a lot of also extension of China's health investment in the region as is part of China's investment in the regional economic recovery. Um, and similarly, we see uh, health being part of China's uh, trade and, and infrastructure program, the Belt and Road Initiative. So where, where the where in addition to the Belt and Road Initiative, there's also an initiative for a healthy Silk Road. So um, I think these regional collaborations are becoming more important, um, but they are also driven not uh, or, or to, to, to a considerable extent influenced by, by considerations that are not primarily about health. And we'll see that reflected. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Um... One of you, Iris or René, some additions, comments on this? Um, Otherwise, we have another question, but uh, no, Iris, go, you go. Sorry, Iris, unmute yourself, please. <laughs> Sorry, I just <laughs> um, I wanted to relate to the question um, on climate change and COVID-19 um, crisis. I think in science we are witnessing just now a lot of um, research which is dealing into exactly this question, what can we learn from climate adaptation um, for COVID-19 and what does this current crisis um, also can tell us um, about perhaps future climate cri um, cli crisis. But I think what is highly problematic in this, um, in this um, science is that they mostly um, forget um, to really um, ask where do these crises come from? So it's not, so, not only about adaptation, but also about changing uh, systems of production, changing, changing economic relations. And I think um, it's, um, yeah, it's really important to make this link and um, to make this link also strong in, in a lot of arenas, be it in, in science, be it in, in, in politics or be it in fora like, um, like this we witnessed today, um, where people from, from very different um, um, continents and contexts can come together and, and make these important links. So, so I think, yeah, it's, it's a, a really a future challenge. Mm, can I make a comment on this? Please, Rene. Thank you. So, so without question, we're moving from a situation where what, what I think was quite dominant, which was north-south determination, is moving into, I think, what, what someone has called um, a, a circulation of ideas. Because it, we've seen it, for example, in the social determinants work. Um, initial ideas on social medicine that came into Latin America um, were reinterpreted in a much more radical manner because of the political economy, the context in Latin America at the time, um, and then influenced debates around social determinants agendas as not being sufficiently political in their understanding and needing to understand social determination rather than just individual factors that affect health in the society. And so I think there is this influence of thinking from other parts of the world that is that is taking place in a constant kind of dialectic. But I do wonder about the processes that are used at global level as to how far they enable that. Um, because and if you look, for example, at the construction of the sustainable development goals, the processes seem to navigate always with little movements of boundaries towards what is affordable and feasible for existing centers of power, even in a multipolar world. Um, so things get reinterpreted through from goal setting to indicator setting or in the intellectual property discussion, they get reinterpreted from enabling production to enabling access. And you know, we need to, at some point, I, I ask myself, when are we going to reach the tipping point? What is the tipping point going to be? Is it climate or what will it be where we will realize that constantly avoiding changes to the underlying political economy in these global interactions is actually not serving our long-term agendas? 
we are moderating them by what is feasible and affordable for current centers of power. With greater generosity, yes, but still we are not we are not yet at a stage of thinking about a global political economy. We are still in a prior framing of these of these models. Um, let me stop there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rene. Um, my record, I see one more point. I'm not sure if you want to bring this up or is this opens another big can of worms. I think this is uh, but so go I, ahead, go ahead. Huh? I, I go, I go ahead. Uh, yes, but it's true. It's, uh, it brings us to another uh, topic, but it's also, also, of course, very much related. So there's a question uh, from Remco van der Pass again, um, asking on digital health and, um, for example, the tracing apps uh, in this new uh, global health security security agenda. What are the risks and possibilities? Um, how to democratically control this digital surveillance trend towards a common good? Uh, how to deal with this as progressive uh, health actors? Thank you. Any volunteers for this question? Shall I start again? Yes, start again. <laughs> um, so I think that's actually a, um, a really important um, a point in question, and again, sort of links to my um, my my emphasis on on sort of interests other than health, really shaping very strongly what what is happening in the global health field, and I think what will be happening, and also linking back to what I uh, tried to get, get across in in my talk at the beginning how considerations of security or notions of security are changing. And I think that's um, that the importance of, of certain technologies and the industries and supply chains that go with these technologies are becoming a really important part of con uh, security considerations of major powers, um, the US, China, but also other countries. And um, that, um, and obviously these technologies are the same or have applications that are very crucial for, for global health uh, practice and, and thinking. And uh, I think this is another way in to which I would, uh, I would um, expect that security considerations find their way into the global health space is by, uh, by is through sort of perspectives uh, or attempts to control those technologies and, and industries that are associated with this. And it's also, again, uh, there's also, so there's also this link again that René highlighted earlier between sort of security, military and the private sector, because of course these technologies are um, invested in by both military communities and the private sector, but they all have really major applications in both sectors and in health. So I think that sort of through these, the increasing relevance of these technologies, we'll see actually a, probably a revamping of a security thinking and practices in health. That's what I'm sort of expecting. And also in the context of all this emphasis on, on decoupling of tech supply chains, uh, that would also have an impact on global health because if you see sort of two, two systems around certain technologies and platforms developing, not one global platform like the internet, but if that's sort of getting, to split, getting split up, that will also have an impact on how we can do global health, how we can communicate. And, um, uh, so yeah, anyway, I'll stop here. And it's, it's not really, again, addressing Remco's question uh, about the chances for democratic control. And maybe I'm in, in a really sort of gray mindset at the moment, but again, <laughs> I don't see not particularly optimistic, but I, I, what I want to push is that when we think about global health, we have to also think about forces and interests and powers that are not thinking about health, but that nevertheless shape that space really strongly. Thank you. Who's next who wants to comment on the digitalization challenges? Say something? Yeah, Remy, please. Sure. So, Remco, I think it's a really critical question because I think that the internet and these digital platforms are actually 
quite fundamental in ideas and in action. And <clears throat> I guess one of the first points to make is that is that digital access is very, very unequal globally. Um, and that therefore, one of the first things, and I think there have been campaigns in countries in East and Southern Africa um, on making data fees for, on, on enabling people to get Wi-Fi internet access at a reasonable cost is a huge issue in many countries for, for many communities. At the same time, it is spreading, so it is there. And then that raises the next question is, is it a tool for extraction or is it a tool for organizing? And in and not just around pandemics, but we've seen community health workers collecting data in countries in East and Southern Africa that gets sent to New York to be to be analyzed in an in a completely different part of the world where the intellectual analysis is done outside that community. For me, that's not democratic. And I think we have to look at who's taking using and managing that data and what was the purpose of it for. So, so democratizing it relates to where the, where the information flows are controlled and used. And, and I think there we have seen around COVID some really interesting experiences of also the production of digital technologies like, like Sunu City in, in Dakar in Senegal. Or, or, or like the Gov network in Taiwan that are actually locally designed, made and used to enable citizens to either make their services accountable or to share information between themselves for organizing or to bring things into a more accessible framework. So, so I think that the purpose of it is part of the democratization, the context. And then I, I think when we're looking at these national systems, there is a really big question about the privatization of public monitoring or public information inside the pandemic, which I think needs to be tackled. Um, and we're looking at sort of track and trace systems, etc., that actually are not are, are gathering huge amounts of information in, in private hands that could be used for commercial purposes or for other purposes. And I think this needs regulation in as much as other forms of private activity in pandemics need regulation and they that needs a kind of a whole new uh, legal framework public health law framework around around information and who controls it um, and how much it is in public interest versus private interest i'll stop there thank you very much renee um iris on your thoughts or you want to perfectly, step um, out. Perfectly said it. <laughs> okay. I mean, can, can I just maybe briefly come in after Rene? Um, because I thought sure. sort of on, on her point about the, the need for a legal framework. And yeah. um, and I think that's that's again like a, a really important point. And also maybe that's where I try uh, turn a bit more optimistic about sort of uh, potential for collaboration and perhaps shared responsibilities. I mean, um, I say, as I said earlier, there are sort of, there are sort of groups of, of countries and organizations that seem to be working together on, on various uh, forms of collaboration, access of sharing access to technologies, but also in the cyberspace area is sort of how do we regulate the internet? Um, and, um, and I think it's really important to push for collaboration, even if if that's not perfect, as in if not everyone is on board, and even if some of the major powers are not on board, um, but still to 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 create those uh, instruments and create those models, um, and because I think then even though uh, sort of some of the the, the major powers, the large particularly large countries don't want to join, I think there is also an element of normative pressure that can emerge from a model existing. Um, and I think like COVAX, for example, at the beginning, neither US nor Russia nor India uh, nor, nor um, China was interested and particularly supportive. But I think there's by the, the very existence of, of this mechanism and as imperfect as it may be, but I think has helped now and with a lot of lobbying to bring at least China on board because there is an interest also of countries like China to be seen as 
uh, globally sort of responsible. And so I, I would sort of argue uh, like that, yeah, even though the, I, I do think we see a sort of a bit of a falling apart of ideas of global community in some centers, but it's, it's really important to keep pushing for collaboration and accept imp imperfection because it, just having certain models can create a pressure to expand and, and of other groups to, to, to join who might do so a bit reluctantly, but um, do so. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so now, Iris, you're still waiting or shall we? Uh, Marika, I see you. There is one more comment. Yeah, but is this not so much of a question? Exactly. There's a comment uh, okay. on, on the WHO uh, and global health organizations. It's an it's yeah. important comment. Um, and it's also agreement on that regulations are needed um, to what uh, René just said. Uh, but there's no new question in the moment. Okay. Okay. I think we have, we had already a very rich discussion and uh, looking to the numbers of our participants, I see that they're slowly also dripping out because they have other meetings probably in parallel. Um, but we would not let you go uh, from the panel without giving us uh, your final, your final round of concluding remarks, way forwards, policy options, and what you say, what you would like to give to us before we can close. So this is this is what I will also have a last thing to say. But 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 first of you, if you want to uh, want to encourage us and push us in the, in the right direction, please give us this direction now. As you like. Who is going to start? Maybe again in the as we had Anne, Iris, Rene. That is fine. Or reverse order. I'm up. Anna, start. Um, yeah, um, um, I think I, I, I saw a um, uh, couple of days ago um, this, um, this publication, uh, Health as a Political Choice, where sort of a, a, this, uh, a lot of um, policymakers from various organizations uh, put together their thoughts on this, and it's sort of an a term that has been around, I've heard around for quite a while now, uh, including something that uh, Dr. Tedros keeps sort of emphasizing: uh, global health or health is a political choice. And, um, and I think that's a really, I really like that starting point. Um, also, because coming from my background, political science, international relations, I think it is important to more explicitly discuss the politics surrounding health. Um, I think that's, yeah, so I like this, the starting point and I would perhaps like add to this and, and want to sort of push it further in, in a consideration where the emphasis is not only on choice, but on the recognition that choice is constrained and people make choices in all kinds of different circumstances. It's individuals, communities, states, and that we really need to look more at the context that constrains the choices that people make and also states make and organizations make with regards to health. And those those contexts are like geopolitical situations, as I sort of talked about in my, in my talk at the beginning, but it's also the, the sort of political economy context that Rene is sort of highlighted and also um, uh, Iris and sort of how we construct uh, health. Um, but I think the sort of I really appreciate and I, I think this is a good idea to to emphasize the link between health and politics and the an emphasis that there are choices and decisions to be made, but perhaps sort of shift the emphasis a bit away from the choice to also the constraints that, that shape what choices are possible and that shape chain uh, shapes what choices people can and want to make. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Perhaps I can follow up to that. Um, that health is a political um, choice, and but it's also um, an opportunity um, to shape things in a new manner. And I think perhaps what I would would wish um, is that 
yeah, we all follow up on, on what we have started here and perhaps that also the work that Rene did um, with making visible all these um, um, bottom up initiatives that are dealing with COVID-19, that this is a starting point to really um, send it on a travel um, to different contexts and um, to make visible what choice, uh, choices under certain constraints there are and how we can involve um, a lot of people to make these choices politically and how to, to shape health um, yeah, collectively and in solidarity. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm very happy to be part of this network and also um, to be happy to be part of, of Medico's um, uh, network who's I think doing a great job in in um, building these linkages and making visible all all this stuff what we need um, to recreate um, better health conditions in the future. Thank you very much for these kind words from medical Rene. <laughs> Thank you. So so I guess <clears throat> one of the one of the points I would make is when we look back we'll want, we'll want to ask ourselves whose story of COVID-19 did we hear? You know, what, what was the story of COVID-19 in 2020? And I think we have to break the domination of certain voices and stories and perspectives and allow others to have more profile. And particularly those that are emerging from the regions and from the community level, because I think they're important. And they're important for mindsets because I think we are in a, a stage which the Chinese word for crisis encapsulate perfectly, which is a mix of danger and opportunity. And if we don't generate the mindset for the opportunity and then the activism for the opportunity and the science and the evidence for the opportunity, we will move into the danger. This is a dialectic moment, I think, in, in, in political choice, as Anna puts it. Um, and I, I on that, I would want to say that I'm really happy that we've had platforms like Health System Global, for example, where we can talk, discuss, and come up with shared positions around this and bring different experiences to the table. And I think we need to reinforce those. And thank you to Medico for this platform. Um, and to say that we're gonna have a, we're putting together a call on comprehensive, reclaiming comprehensive public health. Um, that we want to put out around these principles. And if anybody is interested in being part of that, please let me know because we have people from all regions globally involved in this and we would love you to join. And to thank the people, the colleagues in Health System Global community that have been working around this reclaiming comprehensive public health agenda uh, that we can all feed into. So thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Rene. Thank you all. Thanks, uh, Iris and uh, Anna. Uh, one, one little word from me, uh, our promotional issues. Uh, I put in the chat also the link to our patent kills campaign that we started together with People's Health Movement, Buku Pharma campaign, and a couple of international partners of both of us. And you're happy to have a look at this and support. This is what we think is also one of the points that, that is not spoken about. And this is what, what Rene just adds to it. So there is a lot of speaking now about the COVAX initiative and uh, access to medicines. There's very little speaking about the underlying conditions of how this knowledge of health is being uh, prepared, is being shared how much uh, also technology sharing and knowledge sharing is part of the agenda of the COVID-19 response. I think this is what we will continue to follow up in our networks together with all of you and um, the, the German platform for global health will continue working on this where, Buko, where Medi uh, Medico and Bread for the World are two uh, important members of and internationally, of course, with the People's Health Movement. And I'm happy also to have a lot of academia input into this debate as we had today from Anna and Iris. And so I'm looking forward very much to continue. We will share this, um, this present, this online seminar um, through, I will have to see, we will have, we have all your emails. If you're registered with us, we will let you know 
uh, if it can be then seen on uh, the YouTube channel of Medico and Bread for the World. Um, last words from Mareike. Mareike, did I forgot something? Do you want something to say as my co-moderator? Where is Mareike? Maybe my Riker dropped out already. Is this? Then I only can ask Andrea, is there something we should not forget from the technical? And I want to thank Andrea in particular because she had a lot of trouble with our technical uh, setting up of this webinar. And I'm very happy that it worked so well. So an extra thanks and an, a virtual applause to Andrea for doing this kind of work. And uh, so we hope we are continuing this discussion. We are continuing also bringing this into the debate, even if we feel the World Health Summit could also get a little more of this critical thinking. And um, so then with this and 10 minutes before the, before the end of our original planned date, I'm happy to give you a bit of extra break because your next, your next uh, appointments will start probably, maybe in the World Health Summit, maybe outside, everywhere else. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Yes, and thanks again to Anne Römer Mahler, to Iris Suzek and René Löwenson for making this uh, debate so fruitful and, and lively. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.